my people are a military people, male and female. My revenue is the proceeds of the sale of prisoners of war. All my nation, all are soldiers, and the slave trade feeds them. This is how a powerful West African ruler described his kingdom to a British soldier in the middle of the last century. It's no secret that European traders shipped roughly 11 million Africans to the New World from this very coast. My own great-great-grandmother was one of those Africans. In so many ways, the slave trade has shaped what America is and who I am. There are two things that have always haunted me. The brutality of the European traders and the stories I've heard about Africans selling other Africans into slavery. Hey, my brother, how you doing? Fine. Good. Hey, my brother, how you doing? I've come to Ghana, to the town of Elmina, to find out what really happened along this coast. This was the first European slave trading post in all of sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, it feels very Mediterranean here. You can certainly feel the influence of the Portuguese and the Spanish. 500 years ago, the Portuguese came here searching for gold but they found a far more valuable commodity, human beings. They also found powerful kingdoms whose rulers were happy to trade. Elmina was already a thriving market town, but it grew dramatically with the slave trade. From Elmina, I'm heading inland, away from the coast and the European slave ports to Kumasi, the capital of the Kingdom of Ashanti. From there, I'll travel east on the trail of the notorious kings of Dahomey. Then I'll make my way back to the coast, to Ouida, to the most infamous slave port of them all. Ouida saw the last slave ship leave West Africa, hardly more than a century ago. I'm typical of African Americans of my generation. I'm obsessed with tracing my roots. For 200 years, many of my people had fantasies about coming back to Africa to live. Some actually did, but not everybody stayed. The Ghanaians tell the funniest story about the relationship between Africans and African Americans. 1957, Kwame Nkrumah became the first president of Ghana. He had been educated in the United States. He loved black Americans. He invited all black Americans to come back to Ghana, think of Ghana as their home. All these black Americans arrived in Accra about 1960. When they got here, they came to this beach. And right out there at that reef, they would um, they'd gather at midnight, and they would say these magic ritualistic words from the Ashanti rituals. And then they would take their passports and fling them as far out beyond that barrier as they could. Smack their hands, say they had gotten rid of uh, American racism, and they were home on the mother continent. Six weeks later, the Ghanaians that live just around this beach um, noticed under this full moon all these shadows on, on the beach. And so they didn't know what was going on. They thought maybe they were being invaded by another country. So they got their torches and came down to the beach. And they looked around, and what they found was those same black Americans <laughs> out beyond that barrier searching for those passports. <laughs> We feel at home here because we're surrounded by black people. That's why we come. But the memory of slavery and of what our ancestors must have gone through is always lurking. Even a pretty little harbor town like Elmina is dominated by its slave castle. And for us, a slave castle is like Auschwitz. Right in here. Just 
very dungeon housed between 150 and 200 women for three good months. This is where they slept, yes. But the place was much overcrowded. So there wasn't enough space for one even to lie down. The result was an outbreak of malaria and yellow fever. So by the time the ships arrived, more than half were already dead. Well, this is the infamous room of no return. That is also the door of no return. When the slaves got here, they never knew where they were going. Neither did they know what was going to happen to them. All they knew was to get out of this room onto the boats. Some actually committed suicide. Because that was the only way they thought they could get their freedom. In fact, it was the Africans who did the raiding and selling of Africans to the Europeans. No European ever went into the hinterland to raid for slaves. It was the Africans who did it. And bef be before the Europeans even landed here, slavery was already in the system. It was slaves that worked in the palaces for the kings. I thought it was more, even at that time, than just money. It had to be just some, just something else that drove them to just kill these people. Yeah, why brutalize them like that? Why brutalize? But then again, I guess that's that's justification on rationalization. If you brutalize it, then you have to say to yourself, there's no way we as a Christian people could brutalize other humans, so they can't be humans. But did it surprise you when you found out that Africans were involved as well as middlemen? Um, the thing, I, I knew that Africans were involved. I didn't know the extent to what they were involved. And I also didn't know that once they found out what was going on here, and, and I know that they had to know what was going on here, that they stayed a willing participant in it. That, that's the crazy part of it. I think I was surprised and hurt and angry and everything because, you know, these were people that, you know, you know I sort of had a fantasy about them and, and as our ancestors and your ancestors don't sell you. So that fantasy was sort of blown away. And I, I was, I was uh, yeah, I, I had a, a whole range of emotions. This isn't my first visit to a slave castle, but it is the first time I've heard a tour guide be so explicit about the role of the Africans. Most of us come here to beat up on the Europeans and God knows they deserve it. I'm actually surprised at how honest he was. Dr. Akosua Purby teaches African history and is specialized in the slave trade. The Europeans came to Africa in the 15th century. And when they arrived, they found a well-knit political system in Africa. A well-made political system? Yes, well-knit political system. In other words, they were centralized it with kings, chiefs, well-established political systems. They also found that there was a well-established economic system in terms of trading and so on. And so they recognized who the Africans were. And it was, they found strong states, kings who were ready to negotiate with them on equal basis and partnership basis, hmm. both in their trade and so on. And in fact, when the Europeans started building their forts and castles, they asked permission from the kings to build their land, to build their forts, and then they paid rent for their forts. So they needed, as it were, the Africans to agree on equal basis or partnership basis to enslave their fellow Africans. So if Africans had not sold other Africans to the Europeans, there wouldn't have been a slave trade? I think so. Because the Africans were strong enough, if they had said no, perhaps the Europeans themselves would have tried to go inland, and that would have been very, very difficult. When I come to Africa, you know the first thing that comes to my mind? What would my life be like if my ancestors hadn't been enslaved? Mm -hmm. What would I be? Maybe you would have been a chief. 
in a Santa Mampo. I like being chief. Yeah, you're uh, chief, and people have called you Nana, 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 Brebre, Nana, Brebre, Nana, Brebre. It's a nice idea, but if my ancestors had been chiefs, it's not very likely that they would have ended up in chains on a slave ship. It's more likely that they'd have been selling slaves and buying guns. Hey, my brother, how you doing? Which way to Kumasi bus? Kumasi, down there? I'm headed inland to Kumasi, the capital of Ashanti. This was one of the powerful kingdoms heavily involved in the slave trade. Hello, my brother. How you doing? This bus to Kumasi? Okay, thank you. Hey, how you doing? So this is a bus to Kumasi. Can I sit there? Thank you. My name is Skip. Nice to meet you. Yo, yo, yo. First time I was on a bus like this, I was 19 years old. I just flown from uh, Israel to uh, Dar es Salaam by way of Ethiopia. I got on the bus. It's about 300 miles. It took 18 hours. People got on this bus with chickens, goats, no toilet. It was rough, man. My first night in Africa, I wanted to go home. I spent the night in tears. I was wondering about my roots. I decided my roots were probably in uh, Piedmont, West Virginia, and <laughs> not on that bus. But it got better as time went on. And this, compared to that, this is like Greyhound or something. This is a nice bus. This was called the Great Road, which cut straight through the forest, all the way from the coast to Kumasi. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the Ashanti Empire covered an area bigger than Britain. Very few Europeans were allowed to travel into the interior. They needed the permission of the king, and he rarely granted it. Once in a while, nervous reports would reach the coast. The Ashanti army is numerous beyond belief. More than 60,000 men, acquainted with the use of firearms, ready to sacrifice their lives to the nod and caprice of their king, who is known to be savage and cruel in the extreme. Driving through Kumasi's lush suburbs, it's difficult to imagine all those ferocious warriors. But the Ashanti royal family still has a lot of power, even if they don't have an army to command. I've been granted an audience with the Queen Mother. It's quite an honor. My friend Ivor Agamandua has offered to present me. He knows the Queen Mum, since he's a minor royal himself. The Ashanti royal family no longer has any direct political power, but they're held in great respect. Ivor's driving me crazy futzing around. I wish he'd sit down. Let me let me inform the crew that we are set. He's making me nervous now, and I always get sleepy when I get nervous. Otna, 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 Otna. I've been granted permission to ask just one question. The Queen Mother never speaks directly to a subject. Her court linguist speaks on her behalf. The Queen Mother welcomes you 
to Ashanti and to Kumasi and to her palace here. This is a very traditional palace. Mm. I mean, tradition demands that she's always here. I appreciate her making time in her busy schedule to see us. What is the role of the Queen Mother in Ghanaian society today? The Queen Mother is a mother to all children, to all, all people in Ashanti. She uh, tries to settle disputes, marriage, it could be marriage, it could be uh, farm litigation, it could be anything. Her duty is to always try to sort of be the leading figure who will try to make sure that there is peace in all communities. We'll tell her she has more power than Hillary Clinton or yeah. the Queen of England. <laughs> Madalsi. Thank you. Madalsi. That's the meaning of the thank you. Madalsi. Madalsi. Yeah, Madalsi. My first queen, man. Yes, that's, that's nice. It's a nice meeting. And she has so much dignity. Yeah. She has a lot of power. Yeah. And she's tremendous. I mean, and Ashanti is a very conservative society, so they try to maintain that power all the time. Mm. For 300 years, that's what has been happening. I suppose I did all right, because the Queen Mother has invited me to listen to the court musicians. They're singing a song about the first Ashanti king, Osei Tutu, who founded the kingdom over 300 years ago. Outside the seclusion of the royal enclave, Kumasi is a modern commercial city, but Ashanti traditions are still very important. Ivor has invited me to a royal ceremony, where his uncle is presiding. This time he thinks that I should dress more appropriately. I need the Ashanti equivalent of black tie, so I'm going to buy kente cloth. Now, Ivor, do you shop here? Who? Oh, you, you shop here every day, once a week? How many times a week do you come here? Oh, I mean, sometimes, once in a while. I don't often come here. Once in a while. Yeah. But you send servants? You send your servants? Yes, to yeah, I send them to do the shopping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, I come. Okay. It sounds like Ivor never comes here. And if I had servants, I'd send them too. No, thank you. <laughs> Maybe this one? Yeah. I don't like that one. No. See, I like the blue background. I'm very conservative. Oh, I think it's all with you. Oh, I like that. I think it's nice. This one is nice. How much? Um, 500,000. What? 500,000? Yes. No, the African American press. The brother, oh, no. the brother of the brother. That's why. 500,000? Yes. I am a poor no, professor. No, no, don't say that. I, I, no. a, have you seen any professor? Please, no. <laughs> I haven't heard it before. My, my, in my country, many poor no, professors. No, no, no. We don't have it here. The professors here are rich? Yes. I'm going to move here. I'll teach at Lake Island. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No. I'm sorry, I have no more money. I have no more money. Please try. <laughs> no. Can you show me how I put money? How do I know it fits? You have to put it on me. Mm. 
I like being dressed by women. Yeah. Somebody help me, please. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Mm. I feel like Where's a king already. Baby, do you need, do you need, do you need the help? Yes, please. Okay, come can you help. please come in? Uh, I don't want you. I want her. <laughs> <laughs> no deal. Raise up your hands. Not, you not, look exactly. I'm not the Asante Henny. I'm the Skipper Henny. No. <laughs> It's used now, 250. <laughs> this is the grandest ceremony of the year, when the royal family and the chiefs of Ashanti gather to honor their ancestors. The whole town comes to a standstill while the Ashanti nobility display their wealth and status. Ivor's uncle is the paramount chief. I was having a pretty good time, considering the fact that I was holding this robe together. Celebrations are meant to last all day, but it's the rainy season, and nothing can protect you from this kind of downpour. It's a shame I can't see the whole ceremony, but everyone else has given up, so I guess I will too. I've been so welcomed here. I almost wanted to forget about Ashanti's role in the slave trade, but I can't. The Ashanti sold the Europeans prisoners of war and their own criminals. A large part of their wealth and glory was based on slavery. I wanted to know if they had any regrets, so I asked the king's son, Ohiniba Adoese Poku. The whole Slavery episode was an unfortunate era in the history of Africa, and for that matter, of Ashanti. One would say it depleted the human resources mm -hmm. of the empire, mm -hmm. what perhaps uh, the empire could have achieved, you know, was lost through this trade, you know. So much as uh, we, as I said, do regret you know, that era in our history, you know, perhaps it was a sign of the times and uh, mm. we couldn't have done otherwise. But do you think the Africans understood how horrible the transatlantic slave trade was? No, 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 no. I mean, you know, I don't think they knew. I mean, if they had known, you know, uh, known about the horrible stories that these our brothers and sisters were going through when they were being transported, not only from our coast, but through the transatlantic uh, to Gori, and then a transatlantic route to the States, uh, I don't think they would have continued doing it. You know, I mean, besides, there was no means of knowing you know, mm. the you know, brutalities that um, they underwent. Mm. Perhaps the people around the castles might have seen yes, how horrible it was. they might have seen some aspect of it, but... Um, those of us, that's our ancestors, who were in the interior, mm. you know, had no means of knowing, mm. you know, except through a few stories here and there, mm. you know. But if they had known, I'm sure that they wouldn't have continued doing it. Mm. It's hard to, to turn down such a huge source of profit. You know, the motivation of human beings. Well, that's the, that's the human factor in trading, the profitability of it. Mm. But uh, it happened, and you know, I think most people are very sorry that it did happen, you know, mm. that way, yes. Especially the slaves. And well, I hope so, mm. yes, yes. 
It's not surprising that he should want to explain away this nightmare in our history. The truth is, like everyone else in this business, the Ashanti were motivated by profit. My journey is taking me towards the kingdom of Dahomey. Even more than Ashanti, Dahomey was notorious as a West African slaving kingdom. I'm heading south towards the border with Togo. I've got to cross Togo to get to Benin, and then head north to Abomey, the old capital of Dahomey. It's a day's drive, but it looks like it could take longer in this torrential rain. What's the closest, the closest service stations? How far from here? Uh, I have no idea from where we are now. Mm. It's still wet. wet. Yeah, it's still wet. We'll be fine. We'll be this. fine? Yeah. <laughs> Did you think it was going to start? What? Did you think it would start? Yes, I knew it was that. You knew it was that. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> I knew it was that. <laughs> but you should have you should have told me. It made me feel better. <laughs> Thank you. It was that. Thank you, Freddie. Oh. We're not going to spend any money in Togo, so I want to get money for Benin. I think they all use the same currency. Is the same currency? Freddie suggests that we change money on the street just before the border. Okay, what's a good um, exchange rate? I have no idea now, but we, we, we'll check out. Can uh, exchange $100? Yes, what, what, surely you can. Should I give you the money first? No, you just hold on. Okay. Hey, what? Uh, Maza, I beg you, how much, how much, how much they change dollar for here? Dollar. Uh, CDR around to Sefa. Huh? 58. 58 what? 58 what? Oh, my God, Did he run away? Yeah, I'm good as well. Freddy, did he run they away? Want, the guys don't want to do it because some, I mean, they don't want to, they just don't want to do it. They don't want to be on camera. Yeah. Uh, see. <laughs> I wonder why. They don't want to do it. No, the guys are stupid. <laughs> They don't want to do it because it's illegal. <laughs> We've crossed into Togo. Togo is only 30 miles wide, so before you know it, you're at the border with Benin. Beautiful beach, huh? Yeah. Can we get my passport stamped? Yeah. And then we'll be in Benin. So that's it. Your residence? Massachusetts. Massachusetts? M.A. Okay, I know. I really lost. Mm-hmm. How many is a week? Seljani. Thank you very much. Thank you. At last, I've made it into Benin, the modern name of Dahomey. Stories about human sacrifice and barbarism here were favorite travelers' tales in the 18th century. Traders were far more fearful of Dahomey's kings than they were of Ashanti's. The kingdom expanded rapidly in the 1700s, conquering all who stood in its way. Many people took refuge in isolated places. 
My drive takes me past Gonvier, a village formed in those insecure times. A floating village. The reason this village is out here, built on stilts, is because the king's warriors, the Amazons, couldn't cross water. It was bad luck to cross the water. So the only way that these people could protect themselves hundreds of years ago was to build a village in the middle of this river. And so they did, on stilts. It's incredible. Ça va? The kings of Dahomey built themselves great palaces here at Abomey. At the end of the last century, the royal court covered 100 acres, and 10,000 people lived inside its walls. Today, the palaces are being restored by Joseph Adande. The kings of Dahomey traded a lot of slaves. Abomey has traded from the figures we know now, not far from one million people. Just slaves? Just from Abomey alone? Just from Abomey alone. And you have more from the neighboring kingdoms, uh, Savi Kingdom, for instance, Port Novo Kingdom, etc., uh, etc. Et all the way down to Lagos in Nigeria? Yes, mm. all the way to Lagos in Nigeria. And the canons you can see here are the sign of the slave trade, because they would buy a cannon against 25 gentlemen. Do the citizens of Benin today, through the schools or publicly, talk about this history of the slave trade when the people of Dahomey sold other black people to the white man and then shipped them to the New World? We do not talk much about slave, slave trade, slavery, because for most of Beninese people, 300 years back is a lot. Mm. Those who have been to school know about slave trade, know about uh, what happened to their brothers sold to uh, the New World. And a few months back, we had the bicentenary of the death of King Agonglu. Mm -hmm. And Agonglu was said to be one of the kings who tried to stop slave trade. Ah, but so, of course, he did not succeed. But he must have known how bad it was. Yes, he knew. They knew how bad it was. That was why they didn't trade their own people. Mm -hmm. They would trade people from the wars and battles they did all around the country. Well, there's no attempt to explain away anything here. This recently restored artwork on the palace walls tells the whole story. The kings of Dahomey carried a lot of war. There was almost every, every year a war. This image again shows you that we are dealing with Yoruba people because you can see the scars, scars on their faces. And this gentleman has been beheaded again because, uh, well, but, he lost. But there's so many images on these panels yes. of violence, of conquering. Yes. Was it a particularly violent kingdom? Well, people say and pretend that it is a particularly violent kingdom, but I have not seen throughout history any conqueror not being violent. Have you ever come across someone who is conquering and is not violent? No, generally people conquer by violence. <laughs> okay, so sure. that's uh, this kingdom that did of course cultivate the art of superiority and each king had to train his son to be a warrior, to be someone who is uh, greedy of power, of expanding all over. Hmm. What's this low building over here? This is the building King Lele erected in memory of his ancestors, both male and female. In memory of his ancestors? Yes. And you see you have to bend down before entering this place because you have to show respect. Mm. Instead of kneeling, you have to bend down deeply. It's like a tomb, but nobody has been buried here. Mm. Those walls are made of mud, of course, some gold powder, rum, probably some palm oil, then some blood. And blood? Yes. What, animal blood? Well, there's certainly some animal blood, and uh, probably there was... It is said that there is some human blood into the walls. Human blood? Yes. Were people sacrificed? 
Yes, people were sacrificed, but it's not any slave who is sacrificed. Mm. A king from another place is always sacrificed. The head of the army is always sacrificed. Rivals. Rivals, yes. Mighty rivals are always sacrificed. I'm honored to be granted another royal audience, this time with King Dejelanyi. These girls are the king's ceremonial bodyguard. They're the descendants of the terrifying female warriors of Dahomey. The Europeans called them Amazons, and they were famous for their ruthlessness. They kept the jawbones and skulls of their enemies as trophies. The king still wears the royal nose piece. It's meant to make him look like a leopard, but it's also a royal air filter. The king must breathe cleaner air than the rest of us. Do I bow? I want to talk to him about the slave trade, but for some reason, I feel more awkward about it than I did in Ashanti. Mm -hmm. Tell him my great 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 grandmother came from the west coast of Africa. He's very happy to see his friend, his son, who has gone. London or America uh -huh. to be today a very important personality Tell and them. he returned to home. Uh, you see. Thank you. Thank you. Almost 20 percent of all the slaves that came to the New World came from the Bight of Benin, from this very region. And the slave trade here was run by the kings of Dahomey run far longer than any other aspect of the slave trade, all the way to 1885. So they knew what they were doing. So for me to go to the court of the king of Dahomey, as nice as the people are here, and as much as I enjoyed it, was, for the descendant of one of those slaves, an unsettling experience. This is the last leg of my journey. I'm on my way to Wida, the old slaving port of Dahomey. Hundreds of thousands of Africans were exported from Wida to the New World. Slavery ended here only a hundred years ago, and these streets still feel haunted. For 300 years, the Europeans were in brutal partnership with the kings of Dahomey. But Ouida is also a great religious center. It's like the Vatican of Vodun. It's fascinating to me because Vodun is the only African religion that took root in the New World. It still thrives on both sides of the Atlantic.
These moving haystacks are called the Zangbeta. They're considered to be the moral guardians of the people. I've come to see the ceremony with Martin de Souza. In the market, Martin shows me the instruments of Vodun. Bonjour. Ça va. Ça va. I come here very often. Oh, you do? Yeah. And For you... medicines. So everyone knows you, huh? Yeah. And uh, everybody knows this market. A bit. Yeah. They know about the smell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> about the smell. It's sweet aromatic. <laughs> like perfume. Yeah. <laughs> Here you can buy any animal skull, from a dog or a cat to a bird or a monkey. What are these for? This is, sh uh, yeah, uh, shark. Shark? Yeah, shark. Shark's oh. teeth. That will be with uh, another uh, fish head. Then you use it, you put, uh, you add the head of dog to it. Head of dog? dog. Yeah, and a pig. And a pig? Yeah. Head? Yeah, pig head. Then. You tie it all together. You just put it into somebody's house if you want to hurt him. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it he destroys their nose. Yeah, he will <laughs> suffer. <laughs> What's that? This is what we call poble. Poble? Yeah. This is a hole inside. You tell him everything you want. Then you put it in. So you lock the mouth of your enemy. Oh. He will never open his mouth. Suppose he owes you, you owe him money or something. I don't want you to talk about that money again. Mm. And you hide it. He will never open. He will even forget about you. So if my, my bank that keeps my mortgage, will you tell him? To say, you're a banker. <laughs> I will. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Hey, you, hey, you. Good night. Merci. <laughs> I mean, order a couple of those for me, brother. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. I've really come to Wido on the trail of its most infamous slave trader, Don Francisco de Souza. De Souza was a Brazilian appointed by the King of Dahomey to run his slave business in the early 19th century. He was given the title Viceroy of Wido. As the only non-African on the African side of the trade, Don Francisco has fascinated both novelists and historians. In a world that was turning against slavery, he was an anachronism, but a very rich anachronism. Like a football field. Yeah. <laughs> a big compound. Martin is a direct descendant of Don Francisco. The family owns a whole section of Wida, and only his descendants live here. Here. So this is all the family compound through yeah, here? Yeah, this is all the family compound here. Hmm. And how many people live here? Ooh, about 3,000 of people. 3,000? Yeah, about 2,000 of people. 2,000? Two, Two. Gee, that's a big family. Yeah. It's a big house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you ha have breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> Were you born here? Yes, I was born here hmm. in 1954. Don Francisco fathered 99 sons, and no one knows how many daughters. They were the aristocracy of Wida, and they still are. Tell me about your ancestors. Martin took me to see Prosper de Souza, a senior member of the family. I asked him how he felt about Don Francisco. Mm -hmm. He loved African women. <laughs> he had a lot of wives, African wives. Mm. How many? I don't know the number. I don't know how many. Je suis fier de ce qu'il a fait. I am proud of what he did. Parce qu'il a sauvé la vie à des milliers de gens. Because he saved the life of Suivant many. Suivant ma conception, à moi. According to me, he saved life of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. The king of Abome would have sacrificed all of them. Mm. So he has done a good thing by sending them away from the country. 
But the bad thing is that the slaves in the New World have a hole in their heart. Mais ce qui est mauvais, c'est que tous ces descendants d'esclaves qui sont là-bas ont un grand vide, un grand trou dans leur cœur. Oui, c'est que ils ont la nostalgie de leur ville peut-être. Ils veulent revoir leur patrie d'antan. They have a nostalgia of their country. They would like to come back and see mm -hmm. their country mm -hmm. as it was before. I doubt that Don Francisco was motivated by saving people from sacrifice, but it's obviously a comforting family legend. Don Francisco's bedroom has been kept as a shrine. You mean he lived here? Yeah, he lived here. Hmm. He was even buried in his bedroom. In his bedroom? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'd like that. <laughs> I mean, this is it? Yeah, this is the grave. When he died, they buried him here? Yes, they buried him here. So he was the king of slavery? Yeah, he was. <laughs> I cannot say the king of the slavery, but the king of, you know, Wida. The king of Wida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was very important in the slave trade. I am not proud of him because, you know, the slave trade was terrible. And that sent from out from Africa a lot of descendants, you know. So it's evil business. I didn't like it at all. Mm. I wish I was descendant from slaves. That would, be, that would make me feel better. Yeah. And, you know, I always feel uh, guilty when I meet, you know, African-Americans. And, you know, because my, uh, my position is uh, delicate, you know. At the, I am part of the history, and at the same time, I will be telling the story, the history. You know, it makes me all the time feel bad. Hmm. Yeah. And many African Americans would rather have been yes. kept here yeah. rather than yeah. taken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't tell everybody that I'm descendant of, you know, D'Souza. Mm. I'll tell them that. Yeah, I'm Guvidi, not the Souza. Do <laughs> they get angry? Muslim. Do they get angry? Yeah, some of them. Yeah. And you know, how, if you were at my place, how would you feel, you know, when you tell the story to somebody who would start crying? Mm. And I know from, you know, inside of me that I'm part of the history. It's very sad. But it's not your fault. It's not my fault, but that's how it is. Mm. <laughs> I feel sorry for Martine. I had never thought about the devastating impact that slavery has on the descendants of the traitors. But I don't believe that you inherit the sins of your ancestors. I almost feel guilty dragging it out of her. Martine and I walked down Wida's infamous slave road. The slaves were marched from the market to the ships waiting offshore. So Don Francisco carved this route straight down to the sea? Yes, straight down to the sea. The slaves will be in chains? Yeah, they will all be in chains and walk these roads. This place is Zomayi. There was a dark room here, and those who will not go the same day will be kept here for mm. many months while waiting for the boats. Oh, I see. And uh, they'll feed them once a day, only when it's dark, because they will not see light to recognize where they are staying. It's just to keep them from running away mm. and to make them get used to the life in the boat. So they would go to the bathroom yeah. here, they eat here. Yeah, everything here. You know, there were... Uh, no more human beings. They were treated like animals. Mm, worse. Worse than animals. Mm. Yeah. This is the last stop of the slaves. Actually, we call that monument the gate of no return. No return. So once they cross this gate, it's finished. The destination is uh, the new world. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of activity on that, this beach. 
exchange. The Europeans will bring all the goods here, canon, you know, pottery, bottles of wine. Actually, this is an example. You can see on the land. Lots of broken glasses oh, this, and a lot of potteries, yeah, from these, that time. <laughs> these shards of glass, yes. are that all? Yeah, even this is a pipe, you know, a step of pipe in porcelain. Hmm. So this was like a market? Yeah, like hmm. a market. Hmm. Pipes, pipes and wine for people. Yeah. We had to forgive. It's sad, it's sad, very hard to forgive, but we'll try. It's going to take me a while. It will take a while. Maybe 10 generations. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's terrible. I've often thought that Africa has suffered so much, in part because of its own curse mm -hmm. of selling its own people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. away. Yeah. You know, you can't do that and it not yeah, have an no, effect. No. You can't. It's terrible. Terrible. And very, very bad for our continent. Yeah, very bad. A philosopher once said that behind every civilization, there's barbarism. The truth of this has been brought home to me here in West Africa. I'm proud of the great kingdoms built by the Ashanti and the Dahomeans, but their wealth came largely from selling slaves to Europeans. And this is agonizing for me as a descendant of one of those slaves. In the end though, why should we expect human history in Africa to be less complicated, to be less messy? than it is anywhere else. There is a land of sailing ships beyond the rivers of Kush, which sends its envoys by the Nile, journeying on the waters in vessels of reed. Go, swift messengers. Go to a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people dreaded near and far, a nation strong and proud whose land is scoured by rivers. This quote is from the book of Isaiah, one of many references to Ethiopia scattered throughout the Bible. My family attended a small black Methodist church in the hills of West Virginia. And I was into it. When I was 12, I joined the church. I was saved and decided to dedicate my life to Christ. I even wanted to become a minister. We worshiped in our own way. The church was a fundamental part of our culture. But all of our saints were white. In Ethiopia, the black people here became Christians 1,700 years ago, hundreds of years before Northern Europe turned to Christianity and 1,000 years before Columbus discovered America. To be in an African nation with such a tradition is pretty exciting. And here, most of the saints are black. My journey begins in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. I'll travel north through the Ethiopian highlands in search of the ancient Christian kingdoms. I'm heading for Aksum, home, the Ethiopians say, to the lost Ark of the Covenant, the chest containing the tablets of stone inscribed with the Ten Commandments. My quest feels a bit like Indiana Jones's in Raiders of the Lost Ark.
I'm Professor Gates. In recent years, the only stories that we've heard about Ethiopia are poverty, war, and famine. Yet for us, Ethiopia has always represented something to be proud of. An ancient civilization ruled by black kings. Ethiopia is Africa's holy land. Even the hotel pool is in the shape of a cross. When I was growing up in West Virginia, Sunday meant putting on our finest clothes, shining our shoes, and heading downtown to Walden Methodist Church. <laughs> See, I told you that, that monkey would come in and grab my foot. Oh, thank you. Holy Trinity is one of the grandest cathedrals in all of Africa. This is where Ethiopia's last emperor, Haile Selassie, came to worship. It's the first time I've ever seen a black Madonna in a church. It feels like a scene from an African version of the Bible. A window shows Moses holding the Ten Commandments. These are the very tablets contained in the Ark of the Covenant that the Ethiopians claim to possess. How are you? It's an honor to meet you. Thank you. I'm um, not to meet you. I apologize. I didn't have a chance to change it in my suit. We were out filming. It's all right. We had to rush out, and I didn't want to be late. That's the way you want to be. That's all you are. Patriarch Paulos is the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Few outside Ethiopia take their claim to have the Ark seriously. To the church that they join. But I wonder what the patriarch has to say. Your Holiness, this is not a rude question. I want the Ark of the Covenant to be in Ethiopia, without a doubt. Has it ever occurred to anyone to have a little pinch uh, dated, you know, a little piece of wood or something dated, to prove to all these skeptics that it is actually here? No, faith doesn't go with the scientific proof. Mm -hmm. We don't doubt it, mm -hmm. that it is here in our place. We don't have to prove it to anyone. Mm -hmm. If you want to believe, your own privilege. If you don't, it's your own privilege again. Mm -hmm. So, it's only because you want to fame yourself. Many people have failed to show that kind of a proof, mm -hmm. maybe. So you want to show that. You are, that's why you are curious. <laughs> it doesn't bother us that. It is here and we believe it. Whatever the patriarch might think of my motives, nothing would please me more than for the Ark to be here. The Ethiopians believe that possessing the Ark 
is a sign that they are God's chosen people. And that's an idea that certainly appeals to me. Nowhere is faith more evident than at the holy waters of Kidan Meret. Like Lourdes or Fatima, this spring in the hills above Addis draws people from all over the country seeking miracles. <sighs> The mentally ill are brought here to have their demons exercised. The clergyman, you know? Yeah. He is. Right. Ah, ah. With the turban on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Clergyman is. Cross. Cross. Yeah. Cross. Yeah. Cross. Just, he, he touch. Touch yeah. by the Holy Ghost. Ah. Touch by the Chris. Christ. Cross. Ah. Yeah. Right. Ah. And the devils come out? Yeah. <laughs> I have to say it would take a whole lot of faith to get me into that freezing water. That such faith still exists here is certainly not due to the last regime. After surviving nearly 2,000 years, the Christian kingdom was overthrown in the 1974 Marxist revolution. Today, Ethiopia is secular and is a democracy with almost as many Muslims as Christians. Pessy is so late at night. I'll bring him up. Bring him up. You're going to bring him yeah, up? I'll this is the, him. the film crew is right here. Yes, sir. Oh, How are sorry. You? Mr. Graham, the cameraman. How are you doing, sir? Ethiopia means a lot to African Americans, but I hadn't expected to bump into Minister Louis Farrakhan in the hotel lobby. You take me up first, and then you can come in. Minister Farrakhan is the leader of the Nation of Islam. He and his entourage are passing through on a whirlwind tour of 50 African nations. I interviewed Farrakhan a year ago for the New Yorker magazine. Apparently he wasn't happy that I challenged him about his anti-Semitism, so I'm nervous about meeting him again. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Three questions, that's it. Okay. How you doing? Fine, you? Fine, nice to see you. Good to see you. Particularly surrounded by all his security. Excuse me. Watch yourself inside. Cut the camera until we get inside. Okay. No problem. Sir, checking for weapons. Oh, sure. Okay. Would you turn that off, please? It's my microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to know, I, 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 I didn't like the article, but I thank you for writing about me in, um, in your books and uh, in the article. And I know that as time goes on, we'll do better and better and better. I always do my best. Thank you, Maybe sir. I like what you like. Maybe you like. This time, <laughs> I ask him about Ethiopia. God bless, God, bless God bless you. Well, you know, most of us who were nationalistic in thought always look to a scripture in the Bible that said that Ethiopia one day would stretch forth its hands. And as black people who never thought that we had a stake in the scriptures, but when we found Ethiopia, we found Africa, we found ourselves. So there's a special magic that Ethiopia has. Maybe I'm not using the right word, but it's mystical, mm -hmm. it's magical for black people, Ethiopia, that name, Haile Selassie, among the Rastafari, mm -hmm. and among those of us who never saw a black monarch. Mm -hmm. We saw King George, we saw Queen Elizabeth, we saw all of the white kings and queens, but Haile Selassie, gave us somebody that we could look to to say, well, some of us 
were kings. I set off on the long journey north, traveling back through time, heading for Lake Tana. Between the 14th and 16th centuries, Tana was at the heart of the Ethiopian Christian Empire. For centuries, Ethiopia was a hidden kingdom protected from its Islamic neighbors by formidable mountain ranges. Today, it's still pretty hard to get around. about to descend <laughs> down this hill and uh, our good driver hit the brakes except nothing happened and he hit them again and the car kept going so um, I'd heard about brakes not working but I'd never seen it before and he uh, downshifted immediately and used the handbrake and we came conveniently to a halt the brake shoe had come off We broke down a few more times before finally reaching Lake Tana, the source of the Blue Nile. The Bible says that the Queen of Sheba went to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon to learn how to govern her country better. Here they believe that Sheba was an Ethiopian just like black Americans did when I was growing up. Ethiopians say that Solomon and Sheba had a child called Menelik, who later brought the Ark to Ethiopia. Menelik, the first Ethiopian king, founded a royal line that lasted for 3,000 years. The bodies of five Christian kings, said to be descendants of Solomon and Sheba, are kept here in the island monastery of Dega Estafanos. Hello. Why are there no women here? Yeah, there are no women. They are not allowed. It's not written. Just simply by tradition that women are not allowed. Alamahu Gebrewat, head of tourism here, takes me to the royal crypt. Are they mummified? Mm -hmm. He's uh, the king fascinators of Gondor. So these are, these are all kings? Yeah, all, they're all kings. Gee. King Susunios, father of uh, King Fasilides. Hmm. So uh, 1607 to 1632. And they were also made saints after they died? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And who's this brother here? He's the father of uh, King Zerayapo, uh, yeah. King Dawit. So the yeah. oldest king dates from yeah. 1382? Yeah. Oh, uh, he's the oldest one, yeah. Mm. Up to 1667. 1667, yeah, King Fasilis. Amazing.
የነገስታቱ እንትሪ ነበር swords and knights in shining armor it makes me think of the legends of king arthur in the round table no wonder they say the ark was once kept on this island As a child I'd read about the legendary Blue Nile Falls. So I'm probably more excited than my schoolboy guides as we begin the climb. Can I have some cane? So what do I do? How do I eat it? Just you just eat like this. Like this? Do 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 do. Do I chew it? Abi, do I chew it? Yeah, For centuries, Europeans were obsessed with finding the source of the Nile. The 18th century Scottish explorer, James Bruce, was one of the few who made it to Lake Tana. This is how he described the falls. They struck me with a kind of stupor. It was one of the most magnificent, stupendous sights in creation. I'm following James Bruce's route to Gondar, Ethiopia's capital in the 17th and 18th centuries. The Christian kingdom had won a long war with Muslim invaders, and the royal court settled in a new city to the north of Lake Tana. The road to Gondar is littered with the remains of more recent battles. This area saw heavy fighting in the civil war of the 1980s. It was war and drought that led to the appalling famine of 1985 when more than a million people died. So much dust, it's a wonder it doesn't happen more often. That dust is under the hood, and, that, and the dust under the hood is in the carburetor. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll be back on the road to Gondor. Our journey takes us through a Falasha village, once the home of Ethiopian Jews. During the famine, thousands of Falasha Jews were airlifted to a new life in Israel, and today, only a handful still live here. Hello? Hello? How much is this? Ten, bro. Ten. This is a tin? Yeah. 
10. Yeah. Who is this? It's true sure that Queen Shiva and King Solomon fall in love. They're in bed? In bed, yeah. Making little Menelik? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 10 is too much. It's, that's 7. Oh, okay. So the wholesale price is 7. <laughs> Are you Jewish? Are I'm, you Falashian? I'm Christian. You're Christian? Yeah, but this one is. Shalom. Shalom. So your family lives in Israel? Yeah. He doesn't speak English. Are you going to go? Do you want to go to Israel? Israel He said uh, he, he wants to go there and visit Israel. He wants to go and look at yeah. He has five brothers and two sisters, he said. Ah, and they're all in Israel? Yeah. He must miss his family. He does, yeah. Do you speak Hebrew? No, he doesn't speak no. Hebrew. This is Hebrew. <laughs> Hebrew? Hebrew. The origins of the Falasha are still obscure. Some claim that they are a lost tribe of Israel. Others that they are descendants of more recent arrivals from Yemen. Tradition here says that they are descendants of Jews who accompanied Menelik when he fled Jerusalem bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Ethiopia. I reached Gondar, founded in the 17th century by Emperor Facilidas, whose body I saw in the monastery in Lake Tana. It was the home of a powerful and ostentatious royal court. Gondar is sometimes called Africa's Camelot. James Bruce described it as a place full of intrigue, brutality, and drunken orgies. In other words, a typical royal court. I'm in Gondar in time for Epiphany, or Timcat a celebration of John's baptism of Christ in the River Jordan. This is the biggest festival of the year, Ethiopia's Mardi Gras. from each church carries its tabit, a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. I try to catch a glimpse, but buried underneath all that cloth, I can't quite figure out what the Ark was supposed to look like. is heading for King Facilidas' bathing pool, where the main baptismal ceremony will take place tomorrow morning. How are you? How are you, my friend? Nice to see you again. How are you doing? Yeah. How are you doing? Here I run into Alamayu, my friend from Lake Tana. My wife? Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Okay. Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia? Yeah. I didn't skip. Ethiopia skip from Harvard. You can call me America. Yeah. And, and my kid, my daughter. Hello. Yeah. Hello. English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do people come from all over the country? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Many mm. people come, especially this uh, Ethiopian Ethiopian time. Everyone wants to come here and stay for a couple of days. 
That's why you don't find no rooms, beds in the town. The, the city's so crowded. Yeah, yeah. And everyone yeah, seems yeah. so happy. Yeah, sure, yeah. 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 Enjoy it, I mean, actually. Oh, I'm enjoying Especially, myself. Yeah. I return to Facilidas' pool at dawn to find hundreds of families have camped out all night in the cold. Three hundred years ago, I might have found the king and his wife enjoying an early morning swim. It's as if everyone is waiting for a sign. Then, the first rays of sunlight hit the water. This is the climax of Timcat. Two days of celebration, culminating in a symbolic mass baptism. <laughs> I didn't think he was going to make it there. The crowd cheered him on. Yeah, I've seen a lot of baptisms in my, in my days as a, a, <laughs> my youth as a Christian and in my adulthood. But I've never seen a full group immersion baptism like this with so much joy. It is one of the happiest religious experiences that I've ever seen. And a wet, cold man just brushed past me. I leave the festivities and head even further back in time to Lalabella, Ethiopia's capital between the 12th and 14th centuries. Lalabella has always been hard to reach. Perched high on a desolate range of mountains, hundreds of miles from Gondar, at the end of a dirt road. This time we've lost our clutch. Given the state of these roads, which can bring down tanks, it's not a surprise. And I have a feeling it's not the last thing that's going to happen. In the 12th century, King Lalabella dreamt of creating a new Jerusalem in Africa, a Christian citadel hidden from hostile invaders. 
Twelve churches were hewn out of the volcanic rock, visible only from the heavens. It's remarkable. Seems like it would take a hundred years to dig out of this stone. How long did it take? Do we know? In one night. <laughs> With the help of the angels. <laughs> Anyway, it is uh, amazing. My guide is Samia Kerbre, a tour operator. Mm. This is the place of our nuns. Nuns? nuns. Mm. And there is one monk inside. I see this other nun. Does she have a family? She doesn't have anyone. Body and Moloks are honking nuns, not even men ink. That is why she came here. To... Yeah. She lived, this is her home in there? Zino and Abzidi Hantometa? Abzitometa? I taught Ankabzi? Yeah, she lives here, she does, never gets out. Mm. These nuns and hermits have come to prepare for the afterlife. A final stop before paradise. The 12 churches were built as a great act of devotion. The best guess is that it must have taken 40,000 workers something like 20 years to carve out this holy city. And at the heart of this devotion lies the Ark of the Covenant. Perhaps here I'll learn more about the mysterious Tabit, the replica of the Ark I saw priests carrying at Timcat. Salam. 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 Is there a tablet inside the church? Tablet I lost to. Oh, yes, yes. What does it look like? Many maslow. Sraman si sarai yasta wu kanji min lemam salu tajiku nye gabacho. Min al gabani. Sraman thamrat u lemi dafar faro si sarai. You are not the right question. You shouldn't ask me that. Oh, I can't ask that. Okay. Has he seen the tablet? Ursus, I toy a canoe tablet? Not a million of allegation with him. Tablet, I toy a canoe? I had a limb, you near Babel, and you leave my limb, Lenante, neither should take your opinion. Because I'm a professor and I'm just curious. Any Lamauk Fadligan on G, Lily Lydelum. Takamas of Achille, a Tamaramren, a Nurse Betalem Blachu, Kavuzu. But the Ito, Karaju, Bachelor, at the Fafaru, still, the Nestro Snabani with a regular sound hammerat, Legers and Lachuchalo. And don't trade and don't try to know more than that. Yes, than that. Because mm. it would be dangerous? Yeah, it is dangerous and uh, you will get uh, bad things. Bad things? That's not my promise. Who was angry? The closer I get to the Ark, the more elusive it seems. There are stories in the Old Testament of intruders being killed by the power of the Ark. And I did not want that. I can't believe that here of all places, I run into the Archbishop of Canterbury.
Later on this afternoon, we fly back to Addis Ababa. And we shall fly home very late tonight. But we will treasure your welcome this morning. So may God bless each one of you. I wonder what he makes of the legends of the art. Archbishop, I'm Hello. Professor Gates from Harvard University. Delighted I'm making to see you. a documentary for the BBC and PBS. Mm, so we mm. just wanted to ask you two quick questions. Of course. It's a very beautiful ceremony, I thought. Yes, I think so. And um, I've been here for the last six days. We joined in the wonderful Tim Cat ceremony, mm. Epiphany. In and Addis? In Addis. And um, I've enjoyed the kind of chanting and singing. Um, by the way, I'm a member of that Anglican communion. I'm an Episcopalian, oh, well, so you spoke wonderful, for us. Wonderful. What do you think about the uh, extraordinary claim that the lost ark of the covenant is, of course, housed at St. Mary's Church at Oxford? Yes, it's deeply embedded, isn't it, in the culture and the theology of the Orthodox Church. Of course, coming as I do from uh, my perspective, um, I do not um, accept, of course, the reality of that. But we have to pay attention to the seriousness with which they hold that theology, pay attention to it, and um, enter into a, a dialogue. This is a very interesting branch of the Christian church. I regard it as authentic, mm. of course, and its vitality and prayer life is, is much to teach us in the West. And sometimes, actually, we come at things in too cerebral a manner. We have to get chapter and verse for everything, and, of course, many things have surprised me in what I've heard. But you pay attention to the way they say it and enter into a theological dialogue which I hope will open up in the days ahead. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you, Rajani. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. How are you all? It's beautiful, huh? Hi. 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 Nice, nice, to, meet nice you. to see you. Hope you're enjoying yourself. Hi. Thank you. It's a great cross, man. I've seen some nice crosses, but yours rivals. Yeah. <laughs> the Archbishop may doubt that the Ark is here, but for Ethiopians, it's a reality. This is the final leg of my journey. I'm heading even further back in time to Aksum, the legendary home of the lost Ark of the Covenant. We drive through the Adwa Mountains. It was here, 100 years ago, that the Italian army was routed by the Ethiopians. With the help, some people say, of the Ark itself. This was Europe's most humiliating defeat in all of Africa. Ethiopia is the only African nation never to have been colonized. The emperor's army were renowned for their bravery, but this terrain certainly did not hurt. My route takes me past the 6th century mountain monastery of Debra Damo, the site of the oldest standing church in Ethiopia. I'm here with Roderick Grierson, an historian who's written a book about the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the question is, can black men jump? <laughs> White men can't. This is, <coughs> can black men fall? <laughs> the question is, can right. white men catch? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, we'll do our best. We can do it. I can't let the race down now. Okay. 
No, this one. Like this? But what happens if I let go of this rope? Nothing. Huh? Nothing, because you're, you're caught by the other one. Do I, like this? He cut your two hand here. But I'm slipping. Like this? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay, keep pulling. Yeah. yeah it's good. I couldn't even climb the rope in gym class at school. This looked like Mount Everest to me. Back like this? You're doing great. Okay. Keep pulling. Okay. Keep pulling. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I need help. I need help. Keep pulling. 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 Almost died. <laughs> I'm gonna donate money for an elevator. <sighs> that ain't coming down. <laughs> there we are. It's Project Wide in the world. Would anybody in their right mind build a monastery up here? Well, monasteries are generally built in fairly remote places, and this monastery has been virtually impregnable. There are stories that the Turks took it in the 16th century, but there's no evidence of that, so it's a pretty safe place. It was the, really the mother monastery for the Ethiopian church. I mean, not only is it a powerhouse of spirituality, but monks from this monastery carried the message of the old Aksumite establishment south. So this is a great center of mysticism, it's a great center of learning and culture, and it's a great center of power politics. When Christianity was struggling for a foothold in Ethiopia, the gospel was spread from here. We continue to the ancient city of Aksum. Here in the north, the origins of Ethiopia can be traced back to a civilization at least 2,000 years old. These monoliths, the largest decorated single stones ever cut by human beings, mark the tombs of Aksum's early kings. How important was this kingdom of Aksum? I think Aksum was immensely important. And I think the reason that we must give it the highest standing is that it erected these extraordinary stone monuments. Now, these are taller than any of the Egyptian obelisks. And yet most of us, if we live elsewhere in the world, we know nothing about Aksum. Why? I suspect there was a problem with scholars who simply thought that nothing much really went on in Africa. And this was in Africa, and it wasn't really worth noticing. Little was known of Aksum, yet it was one of the great civilizations of the ancient world, a contemporary of the Roman Empire. It was a powerful kingdom that once stretched across the Red Sea. How did they get them to stand up? It really was a tour de force because there isn't a huge amount of stone beneath the base. We don't know how it was done. That aspect of these objects is mysterious as well. The assumption is that there were ramparts of earth laid down and that these were hauled by people or by animals, but it's all just supposition. We've no idea. There are no records. In the middle of the fourth century, the people here stopped building these colossal royal tombs. Christianity had arrived in Aksum.
This is my final destination, St. Mary's Church. It's where the Ark of the Covenant is said to lie. I have to confess that I have my doubts, but I admire the audacity of the claim. For me, the idea that the most sacred object from the pages of the Old Testament could be in Africa is breathtaking. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared from Jerusalem more than 2,000 years ago. And no one knows what really did happen to it. Could it really be here? This is it? This is it. This is the Holy of Holies. And in here, according to Ethiopian tradition, it's preserved the Ark of the Covenant. Now look here, Roger. Nobody wants this Ark to be in Ethiopia, in a black country, more than I do. <laughs> what do you really think? I mean, do you really think the Ark is here? What, what is in this building? Well, the Ethiopian tradition maintains that it is, and nobody else makes that claim. And therefore, I think it's something that has to be looked at very seriously. Yeah, but that's not enough. Well, that in one, here of the, or not? one of the problems that, that we have with this is that we tend to assume that there's only one ark. And we look at the Bible and we think there's one ark, it couldn't possibly have survived, it couldn't possibly have been here. But in fact, there's a history of arks being used in the ancient Near East. So if one imagines arks not as a single object, but as a kind of religious instrument that existed throughout the ancient Near East. I don't see any reason why there couldn't be an object of immense antiquity and immense importance here. So Roderick believes that there were a number of arcs floating around the ancient world, and one of these could be here. It sounds plausible, but I want to know about the Ark of the Covenant, the one holding the Ten Commandments. Only one person in all the world knows what lies inside that building. A single monk is charged with guarding the Ark day and night. He nominates his successor only with his dying breath. Can we get the monk to come out? Well, one I want to talk to the monk. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk to him as well. I never have. I've seen him on occasions, but of course, he's about his own business, and we're just here passing through. <clears throat> what would happen if I scaled this fence and tried to get in there? Well, I can imagine that everyone here would be extremely upset. There may, there may very well be a riot, and certainly the Guardian will come out and prevent you getting any farther. And I, I, hope it's a, I hope it's an idle question. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be here, in that building right over there. After all, if you think about it, nobody else in the whole world claims that the Ark is in their country but the Ethiopians. But I have to say, maybe the important thing is that the Ethiopians believe that the Ark of the Covenant's here, and they believe that for 2,000 years. And maybe, just maybe, that's enough. <laughs> Discover the wonders of the African world at PBS Online. Set your browser for pbs.org.
Wonders of the African World with Henry Louis Gates Jr. was made possible with contributions to your